Hi everyone and welcome to today's safety and health webcast, how to prepare for any emergency using mass notification, sponsored by Single Wire Software. My name is Kevin Drulli. I am an associate editor with Safety and Health Magazine and I will be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. We hope you all are safe and well amid the COVID-19 pandemic. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I wanna go over some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Type your question and click the send button. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speakers. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey that will appear on a separate screen. I will let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com events. You may also receive a link in a post-event email. In addition, the presentation slides from today's webcast also will be available in a post-event correspondence. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Pat Sheckel, Executive Vice President of Product Management at Single Wire Software. Pat brings more than 15 years of experience in helping organizations across a wide spectrum of industries with implementing tools that enhance safety and communication, and is keenly aware of the challenges organizations face when trying to keep people safe and informed. He and his team are committed to ensuring every organization can reach their people with important safety updates everywhere, every time. Again, we thank you all for being here today. Pat, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Kevin. So just a little bit of background on who is Single Wire. Uh, we're based in Madison, Wisconsin. We have about 110 employees and we have roughly 7,000 customers in more than 50 countries. We made Informacast uh, starting back in 2001, um, which seems like a lifetime ago um, as they're coming up on 20 years now, and really started out by sending to on-premises devices, really started out based on a request that came from the US Department of Commerce um, because they had to comply with a Homeland Security mandate that came out after the 9-11 attacks. So we wrote the software for them to be able to broadcast to all of their IP phones uh, all at once. That was the very first uh, customer, still a customer today. Um, we've garnered quite a few awards in, in the very recent past. These are all within the last uh, two to three years. Uh, and we're, you know, we're very happy to, uh, to be in such great company. Talk a little bit about the use cases of, of what we see. And the use cases, you know, the title of this webinar is clearly, uh, you know, how you can protect yourself in any emergency using mass notification. And the, the overriding theme is that the content is your own. It's whatever you want it to be. We do, of course, ship the software or provision your, your service with, uh, with templates so that you have those ready for you. And those, are, those templates are provisioned by industry. So if you're in healthcare, you get one set. If you're in education, you get another and so on. These use cases are the ones that we see people coming to us for the most often. Um, so Pre-pandemic, active shooter was number one, severe weather was number two. These days, a lot of people are trying to keep in touch with their remote workforce. And so we see remote worker check-in uh, as being a top one. We see health advisories as being another. And again, this depends on your industry. It also depends on your geography, certainly. So there are places where there are mask mandates that are, that are changing based on uh, what the city, county, or state government may be uh, dictating. And so keeping, or even co company policy, which typically follows one of those other jurisdictions. But in any case, the policy changes, you need to let your workers know about it. Um, we see things like uh, messages being sent from our customers to their end users, letting them know that there is a positive case at the facility, they need to shut down for deep cleaning and for testing and tracing, and then they send out another message and they reopen and so forth. And you know, certainly you can use email and, and methods like that. You don't have to use a mass notification system, but for something that's important and or urgent, um, cutting through that noise is really important. And that's where mass notification comes in. So 
when we talk about being ready for any emergency or, or really getting, getting your preparation in order for any emergency, we talk about these best practices. And these are things that we've developed in conjunction with some of the consultants that we work with um, that are independent of our software, certainly. They're safety industry consultants that are looking at how they best keep people abreast of fast changing events. And so we start with, you know, what is it that you care about? Um, and, and what content goes with that? Where do you want to send it? So identifying your use cases is first. You know, we talked about some of those uh, a slide or two ago. Um, you know, if it's, if it's active shooter, that's one thing. If it's severe weather, if it's chemical spill, those all are going to have different plans that, that go around them. And so fitting the mass notification platform to perform the way that you want it to based on what your situation is, is, is what we're talking about here. So you identify the scenario and then you're really looking at who, who gets to send it. Uh, who's authorized, who has permission to send it. And that is something that's clearly going to change by scenario. Um, there's usually not a one size fits all. And so you want to identify those senders. And this is something that, that has really evolved over the years. And what I mean by that is in the early days of mass notification systems, it was all about centralized control. Um, much like the early days of actor shooter response um, was all about set up a perimeter with the SWAT team. And, and we all know how that has changed, you know, post Columbine, um, you know, the active shooter response has changed to the, the SWAT team is the, is the first law enforcement officer arriving on the team on the scene. And then they're followed by, by others, of course, but there's no longer wait. Um, similarly, mass notification has decentralized or devolved in a way and, and what I mean by that is that for certain scenarios, whomever is responsible for safety and has the keys to the overall kingdom is gonna be the one sending the message. But for other scenarios, that's, that responsibility has been delegated often down to the site level and to someone who's the lead at that particular site. So for example, panic buttons are real common. We'll talk a little bit more about this as we go on. So panic buttons are something where you're essentially delegating responsibility to someone to to sound some sort of alert and have that go out. So what is the content? Uh, what's the scenario? Who gets to send it? What's the content? So what is the text, the image, the audio that you want to send? What, what people do you want to reach? And that and you work backwards from that to identify which devices they can be reached on. Uh, and then what do you want to have happen after the fact? So you sent this message. Is it a one and done and it's just informational or is it an ongoing scenario that um, that requires your incident management team, your incident response team to be brought together um, to begin dealing with the situation. And then you have follow-up messages that are going to be essentially created on the fly based on new information that's coming in as the scenario evolves. So it, it just depends on the scenario, right? So what we provide people with is a scenario planning workbook. Um, this is available on our support community. Um, it's available to customers. I believe it is um, it's behind a password, but if you would, if you would like this as a follow-up, just contact us and, I'll, and we'll make sure that you get it, yeah, even if you're not a customer. Um, and you can see, I know this might be a little hard to see. This is a screenshot of that, um, of that uh, scenario planning worksheet. And you see there's different alerts across the top, IT alert, severe weather, armed intruder, and all clear, et cetera. So those are, those are the different scenarios that you're going to be planning for. Um, and you can have as many as you would like, obviously. And then you're really just going down the, the process now. So this is just putting that previous slide into action. So what is the situation? Like what, what do I, what is it that's happening? What's the scenario? So a little description, um, what action is required? So that, that's ultimately like, why do we send an, a mass notification? Sometimes that gets lost. It's not, you know, it's not to check a box to say that we complied with um, the Clery Act or JCO requirements or rather. We typically want people to take some sort of action. So we ask that right up front. So, why are you sending this? What do you want people to do? Is it to evacuate a building? Is it to run, hide, fight? Is, is it to not come to work? Is it to, you know, do come to work because we need extra people for a shift, whatever the case may be. How do you want it to be triggered? So what, you know, what is the impetus for triggering it? Because there are certainly, you know, we talked a little bit about a lot of different methods for triggering. We'll talk quite a bit more about that. So what is your, what is your launch or trigger method? What do you want the subject to say? Long message. So like a lot of platforms in ours, you can have a subject that shows up uh, and then you can have quite a bit more text uh, in the message body. 
the audio, and then there's more fields as we as we go down here. But it really mirrors, I'm gonna go back a slide here, it really mirrors these best practices that again, we worked on these with, in conjunction with security industry consultants um, that go in and, and deal specifically with emergency scenarios and you know, prepping and training and so forth. Um, we did a, a webinar last week on active shooter response um, and, and we talked specifically about this. So how, let's translate this into practice in a customer story. This is for, uh, as you can see, a large SEC university. And their situation was that it was taking too long to get a notification out to everybody. So they went through the whole process of identifying, we have all these different systems that we can use to reach people, but they're not unified. So we have to log into one system, maybe alter the content, send it, and do that again and again and again until they got to all eight systems that were, that were to be used if they had a critical event on campus. And so that took end to end between 10 and 12 minutes to send the message. What they did is they tied all those systems together. So the system that broadcasts to their IP phones and turns every phone into, a, into an emergency notification speaker, tied in the giant voice outdoor system that hits all the common areas outdoors, uh, all the SMS messages, the emails, Twitter, and ultimately their source of truth, the thing that they kept updated and they wanted to drive people back to was the university homepage, the, their webpage. And so they wanted to have the information point back there. And they had us come in and they had us tie, tie all these together using Formicast and then they asked us to do training and they set aside an hour for training and after five minutes we walked through sending three scenarios and they're like you just keep showing us is there any more to it and we're like no for the people who send it that's it that's all you have to do you select the scenario you fill out a little bit more information if you want to and then you send the alert um, because all of those all of the things, the what am I sending, the where am I sending it, what do we want people to do, um, what content is being sent, all those have been predefined, you know, those are in the template, as you would imagine, right? And the distinction is that we're sending to all these different devices. And so this, this slide here is, is what we call our any to any slide. And this is really where we bring that to life in terms of talking about the specific things that you can send to and from. And the real distinction here for us is that we started out, as I mentioned, with the U.S. Department of Commerce sending to their IP phones. Um, and, and so we started out on premises. We added desktops. We added uh, a patent for sending to IP speakers um, that grew into its own industry. Um, we were, have the ability to tie into your existing overhead paging systems. And you think about how those are used today. That's on a building by building basis, typically, where you're picking up a phone and you're dialing a, co a dial code, and that is letting you broadcast audio out those speakers in that particular building. We tie all of those together. So if you have 10 buildings, 20 buildings, 100 buildings on campus, and you want all of those to broadcast the same audio at the same time, we, we do that. So this is really where we started, is on this on-premises capability. Although most people, when you hear mass notification, you think of mobile alerting. Uh, and, and that's certainly a very necessary component of mass notification, but by itself, it is insufficient. And the reason for that is that there's been a lot of research done, published in the Journal of Homeland Security and in other places, that speaks to mobile mass notification. And, and really when you boil it down, mobile mass notification is essentially SM, bulk SMS text messaging. And of course it can do a little more than that, but in terms of how it's used in practice, most people don't want to install an app. We have an app, all of our competitors have an app that you can install on Apple and Android phones, and it'll give you a richer experience in terms of um, ours will let you broadcast the audio of the message. You can include an image. Um, and so that's, a, that's certainly a better experience than SMS, which is going to limit you to text. You can still do message confirmation in either of those, uh, in either SMS or in an app, but people don't want to require their, their people, um, whether it's employees or students or staff, they don't want them to have to install an app, typically. Some do, but, but most do not, just in terms of percentages. Phone calls don't work. Um, and, the, and the reason being, as you can guess, is just so much, so much robocalling going on, um, so much call spamming that people don't answer the phone. 
So they might get a message, but it's just not a timely way to get a, a notification out. And email certainly isn't timely either because most people aren't sitting in front um, and watching email or getting notified. So when you boil it down, mobile notification, the one really effective method is SMS text messaging. But even with SMS text messaging, there's a lot of people that, that you need to reach quickly, that you, have a, that you owe them a duty of care, but you don't have their phone numbers or they're, um, you know, you're not gonna reach them because they're in a poor, poor cell coverage area, the phone is in a bag, briefcase, turned on silent, they're in a meeting, et cetera, right? So when you boil that all down, they found that mobile mass notification reaches about 80% of your desired population. And 80% sounds okay, except if you're the one person, you know, if you're one of those 20% that didn't get the message and there's a tornado bearing down on the building or there, um, you know, there's an active shooter on campus or, or what the, whatever the case may be. And so that's why multiple notification methods really matter is because you want to have that, that reach. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. So speed, that speed of getting that message out. That's the other thing. Mobile mass notification is, is going to have, uh, is depending on how many alerts are being sent in your region at the same time. If it's a regional emergency, like the Boston uh, Marathon bombing, um, or the, um, the I-35 bridge collapse in Minnesota. That one's quite a while ago now. Um, wildfires, certainly. You know, you have a, um, a regional emergency like that and you have problems with the cell network being overloaded. Um, so what we look to is, is trying to maximize speed by giving people multiple triggering options. This is on the inbound side. So how do I start the message? And of course, you can come in and you can select a scenario in Command Center, which is just available in the admin uh, web console, or you can do it from your mobile phone. But we have other methods as well, both manual, as you see there, you know, panic buttons that can be physical or virtual in nature, um, and then automated triggers. So tying directly into the National Weather Service, tying directly into gunshot detection systems, early earthquake warning systems, and so on. Our machine to machine capability gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of tying into the physical world. So for manufacturers, that's things like line stop buttons, eye wash stations, loading dock doors, uh, and ammonia sensors, uh, you know, the list goes on. On the outbound side, that means automatically locking doors typically. So when we see physical security systems, we're talking about tying into access control as part of what we're doing there. So really what you get when you combine on-premises alerting with mobile alerting is better speed and reach. So you get a lot closer to 100% of your desired population and you're gonna reach them faster too. The other layer that, that we bring in and that this really applies to you know, any emergency is audio. Uh, and audio we take for granted in certain scenarios like a fire alarm, right? You wouldn't think of only sending a text message to everybody if the fire, if there was a fire in a building, right? We solved that problem a long time ago. There's loud intrusive audio. Yet for many scenarios, uh, active shooters, severe weather, et cetera, we, many organizations are only sending text messages. And you see that, that distinction there. I mean, you, you could argue that active shooter, severe weather and other scenarios are just as important as fire yet we don't treat them the same way in terms of how people are notified. So what we aim to do is to turn all your devices, your in-building devices into speakers that can broadcast loud intrusive audio. Your IP phones, not by calling them, which doesn't scale and doesn't provide audio. Um, people have to pick up the phone to answer that. We don't call them, we broadcast audio on the, on the network and it takes over the phone and broadcasts audio at the speaker phone without anyone having to touch it. Um, and the same thing for computer desktops, whether those are laptops or, or desktops and whether they're Mac or Windows. And again, for traditional overhead paging, giving it new intelligence and then IP speakers. And IP speakers make sense where you're talking about um, adding on to an existing system. So that's it's speed, reach, and it's intrusiveness. And the intrusiveness goes a really long way towards the ultimate goal, which again is what? It's getting people to take a desired action um, because you can tell people what you want them to do. So just to bring this into relief, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about a scenario. This was uh, at a large hospital system in, uh, in a Great Lakes state, and they had an active shooter situation. It turned out it was, they believe it was an active shooter situation. It turns out, thankfully, it was not. It was a tragic situation where a young man drove to their facility and took his life with a single gunshot, but they heard the shot and they believed that there might have been an active shooter. So they sent out an alert. Um, this is before they had our system. And they are trying to notify 30,000 people. And a lot of people didn't get the message. And they did a post-mortem survey to try to understand how people wanted to be notified. And the key takeaway was that people wanted to be notified based on whatever they happened to be doing that day. So if they were walking in between buildings in the Skyway, they wanted to be notified on the overhead paging system that's in that Skyway. If they were off campus and driving to the hospital system, they wanted to be notified via text message. And if they were sitting at their desk, they wanted a desktop pop-up that took over all the windows on their screen, popped to the front and let them know, you know very intrusively what was happening. Well, the, the key takeaway is, of course, that the next time that there's a scenario, you don't necessarily know what that scenario is going to be, much less where you're going to be when it happens. And so it just underscores how important it is to have, for certain scenarios, to be able to send to lots of different communication channels or methods. Um, and so that was their realization, and, and they have now implemented this. They've put it in practice, and they have the ability to send to all of those different devices, or most of them anyway, um, because there are so many that are available. So let's talk a little bit about what it means to be prepared for any mass notification emergency. And, and you know, it's typically about tying in the things that you already own. Um, and so a lot of people, a lot of organizations have digital signage out there and there are a number of ways of, of tying in digital signage. The industry seems to be coalescing around CAP, the common alerting protocol. That's one example. So you've got screens everywhere. Why not use them to communicate what the message is? Um, there are different panic button options available. We'll talk to this. So this isn't, this is not meant to be exhaustive. It's meant to give you an idea of the things that we can tie into. Uh, so that you can enable your systems to either create a faster trigger for an event so people are notified more quickly, or it, as is the case for most of these, you're trying to establish more endpoints so that when you want to reach people, you have more options for reaching them. So let's talk about some design considerations here in terms of panic buttons. So panic buttons are key if you're trying to give the power of initiating an alert out to a person or, or a group of people. And so this is really underscored by what happened at a, a small uh, private college in Southern California. It's probably about three years ago now, there was an incident where there was a troubled young man in the community, um, not related to the college, um, who who killed some family members, set the house on fire, jumped in the car um, with weapons and drove to the edge of the college. Shot up some more vehicles on his way into the college, ran into the library. And so the, li the, li the people working in the library wanted to notify the people in the library, but the whole campus if they could, right? And so what was the first thing they had to do? They had to call campus security and tell them what was going on. Campus security verifies what's happening, logs into the web console of their mass notification system and sends an alert. By that time, the active shooter had moved on to the next building. So it, it just underscores why there's an importance in the need to, to delegate this administrative authority for certain situations and why panic buttons, whether they're um, the flush mount under the desk, like you see in the top left there from advanced network devices or the Informacast mobile app that you see in the, in the top right, um, on the bottom left, a virtual panic button. So just a, a, a line appearance button on an IP phone that, that will trigger an alert or a, you know, a different physical panic button or even a wireless panic button that people wear like as lanyards now, those are becoming more common. Whatever the panic button is, it can trigger any alert that you want it to. It's you know, typically the use case that we see is that you're not gonna do maybe a campus-wide or system-wide lockdown with the initiation of a panic button. Um, that's, you know, there's just too much opportunity for bad things to happen there. But what people do want to see happen is they want to lock down the immediate area 
and also notify campus or, or corporate security when this happens. So it's a kind of a two pronged scenario that's happening when that button is pressed. So let's talk about IP speaker. What you see here are some different form factors and IP speakers are kind of their own category of notification endpoint. First of all, I'll say if you have an existing traditional analog overhead paging system, there are two proven technical ways of integrating with that system. You do not need to rip and replace it if it's working just fine today. In fact, we can give it, as I mentioned, some new intelligence in the sense that if you have 10 buildings or 50 buildings, instead of broadcasting to them one at a time, we can broadcast to all of them at once with the same audio stream. So let's just, just to level set, you know, we're all about helping you save money because IP speakers are, are not inexpensive. Um, and the places where you want to use them will depend on your particular scenarios. If you have places that are not well covered by your existing overhead paging system, IP speakers make a lot of sense for that. And the reason is because they don't require an amplifier. They're self amplified. They're you, you almost always power over ethernet. So you just need a, you just need a cat five drop to that location. You plug it in, it registers with the system and now you can send it audio. If it's a model like these, like three of them that you see on the screen, it can, it can scroll text. So it'll be a clock when it's not scrolling text, but it will scroll text. Many of them have integrated LED flashers to even give you more visual notification. So they make sense, again, areas that aren't covered real well, or they do make sense if you are doing a new building. Um, that it's a greenfield situation. Um, because if you're looking at specking out the cost of a new analog paging system where you need an amp and you need a separate cable plant, et cetera, then the cost of IP versus the cost of analog is going to be comparable. You know, some other benefits too, you can individually control the volume on them, um, which can be really helpful in a lot of situ situations um, where you wanna turn maybe a hallway speaker up but a classroom speaker down, that sort of thing. So to talk about another, another way, we talk about different notification scenarios and I, I'm just peppering some of these in here to, to give you some ideas about how this might work in your organization. This is a relatively unique one. Um, I can't tell you that all of our healthcare systems are, are doing this, but, but many are. And it, it started with uh, a public, it started with Laguna Honda Hospital, um, in, which is a city hospital in San Francisco. They have a video case study on our website you, that you can look up if you'd like to hear them talking about this in their own words. But really kind of a unique scenario where it used to be, this is for a wander risk ward, so patients with dementia often, and so they would, they would wander off and they, they would try to leave that floor. And when they did, they had an active RFID bracelet from at the time Aeroscout, now Stanley Healthcare. And it would trigger an, just an alert, um, a tone. And then a medical assistant would have to get up and have to chase after that person and have to turn them around. And this happened multiple times a day. Um, and, and so it was really, it was stressful for the caregivers. It certainly wasn't a great experience for the patients. And so they tied that system into Informacast. They did an integration, which means that now when a person crosses that threshold, they will hear in a speaker that is directly above the threshold in the ceiling, they will hear the spoken recorded voice of their loved one telling them to turn around and go back to their room. So when they check in a patient, they get this recorded. And now instead of a tone going off that only serves to confuse that per person further, they hear, hey, Uncle Jerry, everything's okay. Turn around, go back to your room. So you can see just a, a, a it's very effective too. So it, it, they didn't have nearly as many cases of medical assistance having to chase people down. Um, and it's just a kinder way to treat the patients. So talk a little bit about, you know, some unique ways when we talk about any emergency, and this is something that um, for people interested in science in particular, um, really didn't have a way of doing this a while ago, you know, maybe a couple decades ago, but you know, now there's USGS sensors in the ground all up and down the West Coast. So this is really only for the three West Coast states, but if you're in one of the other 47 or in another country, hopefully this, you just find this interesting. I'm going to spend just a short time on it. We always, you know, when I was growing up, we just took it for granted that if an earthquake happened, it just happened. You're never going to get any 
advanced warning, unless there had been like tremors, you know, leading up to it. And even then it was, you know, the news might tell you that it's likely an earthquake would happen, but that's the best you would get. You wouldn't actually get real notification that one was on its way. Now you can get up to 60 seconds of, of warning because of that sensor network ties into software from one of our partners, Early Warning Labs, with, which then triggers a notification to us. And you say, well, 60 seconds isn't a whole lot. And no, it is not. You certainly would like to have more. But um, it gives fire departments the enough time for them to get their doors open and their trucks out. Because if their building goes down and the trucks are trapped, then they can't go help other people. So you think about stuff like that. It brings elevators to an orderly halt and lets people get out of the elevators. It lets a certain amount of people get out of the buildings altogether. You know, so there's a number of different things that it can help people do. So iPaws, the Integrated Public Alert Warning System, this is another inbound integration. So you talk about any emergency, this is really gonna to apply to those organizations that have been granted access by FEMA, but it's really great technology because we talked about you know, how tough it is to get a hold of everybody on mobile phones. And one of the reasons that you would not be able to is you don't have people's phone numbers, um, especially in, in facilities where you have a lot of transient people, healthcare, um, maybe uh, airports, you know, that sort of thing. And, and so if, if, you're, if you're a county, if you're a, a large city, if you're a major university, um, you may be able to get access to this system. And essentially what you're able to do is take over cell phone towers and within a limited geographic area. And if you have a key emergency, you can send out an alert and you can notify everyone who's within uh, who's within range of that cell phone tower without needing their phone number. So if you think about, I think most of us are familiar with like Amber alerts and silver alerts and that sort of thing. That's using WIA. The other thing it can do is it will, um, it will allow you to do that scrolling text across the, the bottom of uh, the television broadcast. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, if you just think about how, how people send, um, a, a couple of years ago, we were working with our end users and they said, we just need a, a vastly simplified way of sending an alert for our security operations center people. So it's, some people call them dispatchers, some people call them other titles, emergency coordinators maybe. But what we did is we developed this concept of a scenario where you can trigger multiple messages from that one scenario. So I, I talked about this a little bit earlier where you might want to send one alert that goes to your incident response team and letting them know what's happening. And yet you have another alert that you want to go to everybody. So you can trigger in that case, two alerts from one scenario. Um, and what this does is you, if, you, if you click on one of these tiles, it pops up questions that you've pre-programmed. So it might be what type of, what type of chemical spill is it? And what, what building is it in? And you can select from a dropdown or you can give people free form text. They can, fill out the message and they can send it out. So again, just a really simplified way of sending. And this is available on the web console. It's also available on the mobile app, um, the same exact scenarios. And if you run Microsoft Teams, you wanna want to give people the ability to send from inside Microsoft Teams, you can access this functionality from inside of Teams. And of course, once you sent an alert, it's really important to understand what's going on. So who responded with what? Um, and how long things took to get there and, and all of those things. So just a quick, I'm not giving you a, a demo right now. I'm just giving you an overview. If you would like a demo and you want to see how we light up these different devices and you want to see the software in action, let us know. You can also, uh, you can also um, fill out a form and get a free trial of the software. And I have the link to that uh, at the end of the presentation here. Desktop notification is something we get asked for a lot these days. I think one of the reasons is that people are spending more time than ever in front of these and, and, and organizations are looking for more intrusive ways. And so we have the ability to pop a notification to the front of all the windows. Um, or it, as is the case in some scenarios, people don't want to do that. Like in healthcare, you know, you could be operating on a patient, you don't want a desktop pop up. So they want to scroll across the bottom as a banner. We have the ability to do that too. Uh, if the, if the laptop or desktop is connected to the company network, we can also automatically play audio out the speakers. Um, so we can turn it into an emergency notification speaker endpoint. 
And then another way of, of getting in touch with people is, is by tying into collaboration platforms. And you can see this snapshot from earlier this year where collaboration platform growth just exploded. Um, and I probably don't need to tell any of you this. You're probably spending, like me, way more time than you used to inside of these tools. So whichever flavor you're using, Microsoft Teams, Cisco WebEx Teams, Zoom, et cetera. So we really believe that it's important to reach people in the platform that they're using all day, every day. Uh, so we have the ability to trigger to and from both Microsoft Teams and Cisco WebEx Teams. And this is a customer that took advantage of that. So um, Technip is in, this, this location is in France and SMS is, is really challenging there in terms of uh, getting complete carrier adoption to deliver notifications. So they wanted to do this they want to do their notifications without relying so heavily on SMS. So they had everyone deploy Microsoft Teams. They had nearly 5,000 employees um, bring this up and contractors as well. Um, and now they receive those alerts on Microsoft Teams, whether that's the client that's running on people's laptops or on their mobile phones. So I mentioned, you know, how this mass notification system can be used for any emergency. And, you know, right now we're of course still very much dealing with COVID. We put together a compilation of all of our writing on COVID, um, including access to our message pack, message templates that we put together based on what we saw our own customers sending to their end users in the spring. We rolled that into a message pack. Um, and all that information can be accessed um, at that URL there. And, and you don't have to remember that URL either. If you just go to singleware.com, there's an orange banner on the front of our website right now. When you click that orange banner, it'll take you through to our COVID um, research. So um, speaking of COVID, I, I wanted to share this use case just because I thought, again, it was a, it, this one is, an, is not an emergency use case, but it is, uh, it is an uplifting one. I thought it was, it was kind of neat. So this was a hospital in the Bronx, as you can see there uh, on, the, on the tweet um, location stamp. And this was back in April. And they, you know, they, were, they were in the midst of a, you know, just a huge surge at that point. It was, things were really pretty bad, if, if you recall. Um, and so they wanted to celebrate whenever a patient was discharged from the COVID unit. So whenever someone had beat it. And they wanted to be able to do this on their own. And so they, they contacted our, uh, the salesperson that handles um, their account on a Friday afternoon and the IT department at, at the hospital said, we need to get this spun up. We need to be able to notify people whenever this happens. And because they're in New York, they chose Empire State of Mind by Alicia Keys. And they were able to do just with a dial code. So dial a phone number, a four digit phone number inside the hospital and would play this on the overhead speakers and on the, um, the IP phones. And, um, and this went a little bit viral because they tweeted at Alicia Keys and then she retweeted it, but it was, it was kind of a neat, uh, neat story there. So nearing the end here, I encourage you, if you have any questions, we have time for them. So go ahead and enter any questions you have into the Q and A panel. Um, I'm throwing this up, uh, our, uh, our social media presence. We do post blog posts uh, uh, roughly twice a week and there's some really good information out there. So things, uh, talking a lot about just mass notification as an industry and safety as an industry. Um, there are some product things, of course, but it's mostly um, non-product. And then you do have the ability to get a free trial there at singwire.com slash mobile. There's a really uh, quick and easy form and we have, we revamped our process this year to make it far easier to get spun up uh, and to, to get a trial of the software. Um, so I encourage you to do that. Uh, and you can reach any of us who want to email us uh, anything else, just hit us at sales at singware.com. We'll be sure to get that. So with that, um, love to go ahead and take any questions um, that we might have out there. Very good, and Pat. No, excellent. We, uh, we thank you for your insights and expertise. Before we do start that Q&A, just want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey that we're asking you to complete. The survey will open up in a different screen after this presentation. Your input is important because it'll help us improve future webcasts, and we really do appreciate you taking the extra time to offer feedback. Pat indicated there about that Q&A panel. Just one more reminder, if you want to ask a question, you just click that button, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type your question, and click the send button. And you can feel free to, to ask your question at any time as Pat gets to these first few. 
So with that, Pat, here now are some questions. Um, first one, what makes a mass notification effective? Yeah, great question. So, you know, ultimately, what makes a notification effective is that is if it gets people to take the desired action. Again, we go back to that. Um, we go back to what what we want people to do, right? So we want people to take a particular action. So when we look at the elements of what makes a notification effective, it's speed, it's reach, and it is uh, intrusiveness, or, or does it create a sense of urgency? Um, and so we talked about, you know, the speed, you get the speed and the reach by tying into many different endpoints, and you get some element of speed is just going to be the platform, you know, it, it's robustness, like what can it do? Um, it's scale, it's speed, it's, it's that sort of thing. But one of the other ways that you get speed is that you tie into multiple triggering systems. So some of that is process and again, delegating that administrative authority to let people, for example, hit a panic button, whether that's virtual or mobile or what have you. And some of it is by tying into automated systems like early earthquake warning and uh, uh, gunshot detection and um, automated severe weather warning by tying into NOAA and so on. So there's a number of elements that go into it, but ultimately when we talk about effective notifications, we're talking about speed, reach, and intrusiveness. Next one, what's the primary method that you see organizations using for communicating during emergencies? And then are there any drawbacks to this method? Yeah, well, the, the primary method um, outside of fire um, is is sms you know so people are using sms uh, alerting and there's a there's a lot of competitors out there um and and so you see that again we're not going to tell you that you shouldn't do sms you certainly should it is a necessary component it is not sufficient by itself and so that's where that's where we try to educate people on well what is your scenario and, and what is your sla uh, for that scenario. So if you have, you know, if you have a, a tornado, if you have an active shooter, um, if you have a chemical spill, what are you trying to, to do? How quickly are you trying to notify people? Um, and so that, that, that's really what we look to is get beyond SMS because um, by itself, it's not effective. And SMS stands for short message system. I got a, a Q and A um, question here. SMS is sh a short message service. And what, it's just a text message. So when you get, you know, a text message on your mobile phone, that's SMS. No, thank you for addressing that. I had seen that too. Um, above that though, someone asked, um, they, they say, I may have missed it, but when looking at the website on pricing, it states that there's a minimum of 250 users. Is this not available to less? I th yeah, I think we need to, we need to um, reframe that. That includes up to 250 users. You don't have to have 250 users to, to use that. So it's just the base block that, that you get. So you can have 50 users or 175 users and um, that base block will, will get you everything that you need. Next one, why is it important to leverage multiple communication channels for emergency messages? Yeah, and this is really, so we've seen this for a number of reasons. One is just to make sure that the message gets there because no single method is going to be 100% reliable. We saw this with the wildfires, right, where, where there were communication channels that were completely down. Um, so that, that's one. The other is, is speed. I mean, people think of SMS as being very fast, and it is if I'm sending, you know, from me to you. But if I'm sending 50,000 messages, and by the way, there are, there are a thousand other organizations and several million individuals that are all trying to do that at the same time, it's not going to be very fast at all. Um, and so that's why you have to take into account, well, what type of scenario are we looking at? If it's a regional type emergency, and there are many, right? Could, if there's a terrorism incident um, that's on the news and now everyone knows about it and they're, they're all trying to use the same communication channels. Um, taking that off of a public carrier network and getting it onto your organization's network is going to be far faster. So sending audio um, to all of your IP phones, all of your desktops, all of your overhead paging, whether that's analog or IP, those are going to be ways that are going to be really fast or even using push notifications, right? Because that's going to be data traffic that is not going to be dependent on the number of um, 
you know, SMS ports that have been provisioned for a given cell tower. Next one, um, it acknowledges, I know you spoke to COVID and everything that's going on. As, as we ideally get out of it and it begins to dissipate, what, what are some elements of, of what you're discussing that might carry over and be longer lasting in, in the future of this type of communication? Yeah, so I mean, COVID was a, was a big shift, right? Because as much as we're talking about in-building notification is, is being important. COVID took some of that away. Most of us are not going to a carpeted office environment anymore if we were in the past. I mean, certainly there are some industries that are still, that never stopped going into the office, um, healthcare being one of them. But it really changed things up and we, we had new use cases. Um, talked about some of those, like health advisories. We have a healthcare, we have multiple healthcare systems that are sending out alerts before every shift asking their people to confirm that they're healthy. And that's not something that we saw previously. Um, and you might, you know, my first reaction was, why would they need to do that? Like, if you're a healthcare worker, shouldn't you know that you need to be healthy? And the answer is obviously yes, but we all need reminders, you know, behavioral modification reminders. And one of the reasons they, they needed to do it is because you know, healthcare workers get sick all the time. And, you know, they're always around people that are sick. And, and so they're, they're used to, you know, just taking maybe a couple Tylenol and just soldiering on. But you know, now, of course, you know, infection control dictates otherwise. So that's, that's uh, you know, just a different approach. And so we, had, we adjust our approach, but the tools were the same, like the system is the same. The system can still send the alerts out, can get message confirmation back, allow you to take action based on the messages that you receive. So I think the key takeaway is, yeah, you know, COVID was a huge curveball, um, but it, it just shows how resilient these, these systems are and how important it is that, that you have a system that, that can, can deal with this. And I think that ties into the, the next question I see here is, you know, can this mass notification system be used for remote loan workforce spread across the country? And the answer is absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's a loan worker notification is not something we talked about in any depth today, but that's another one, right? So you've got people maybe out working in the field um, maybe working at electrical substations or whatever. Um, and so they're out there working and you want to, you want to go ahead and you want to make sure that you can keep in touch with those people. Um, and so that's another thing. We didn't talk a lot about grouping today. Um, I think the, the implied grouping for a lot of these types of messages is everybody, right? I want to, I want to send to everyone. And if it's, you know, depending on your location, that might be the case, but there are certainly a lot of workforce notification use cases that come up a lot where people are just trying to communicate with either a, an individual or with a small work group. Um, and mass notification, you know, the name certainly implies otherwise, but it allows you to do that. A good mass notification system doesn't mean you, you have only the ability to communicate in mass. It means that you can scale up to everybody, but if you wanted to do some subset thereof, you certainly can't. And that's, a, that's another key takeaway. So again, the, the, the message scenario, you know, what am I sending, where am I sending it? That where am I sending it, that's up, that's up to you. So if you want that to be, when I hit that panic button, I have three first responders that are on the other side of this wall and they're the only ones who get the alert because you want them to check it out first before they send out a broader alert, then you can do that. If you have people out in the field and you want to just do a, a check-in with them on a daily basis, you, you can do that as well. So it, it's really flexible. Um, and we're not unique in that regard. I think most mass notification systems scale down as well as up. But that's, it's a fair question because we spend so much time talking about the mass notification that you want to make sure that you can do more granular notification, and you certainly can. Well, no, thank you. And again, just reminding everyone, if you would like to ask a question, hit that Q&A button there at the bottom of the screen and type your question and click send and we will feel uh, be happy for, for Pat to address that here. Um, with that, I got another question. Um, why is it important for organizations to be able to reach their people on mobile and on on-premises devices with mass notifications? Yeah, so I, I think we've, we've hit this one pretty hard a, a couple of times, but just to reiterate, it's re the reason it's so important to do mobile and on-premises is because it will give you a more effective notification. It will give you better speed, better reach, better intrusiveness. Um, and, and so the more, multiple, the more communication channels you can add on, 
um, the more effective it's going to be. And some people, when they see that any to any slide, they get a little scared. Like I can send to so many things. Like I'm never, I don't, one, I don't have all of those things. And two, I'm going to have to get it involved. And it's going to be a big to do to get every, to get all of those. And, and I can empathize with that. And I can just tell you walk before you run. So do something, send, get a mass notification system, get it calibrated, start with mobile and then maybe add on desktops and then add on digital signage. But don't think that you have to do everything uh, with, your, with your first go at it. Walk before you run. All righty, well, uh, no, Pat, you've been, been so very thorough today. We, we thank you. Um, anything left unsaid or anything else you might want folks to know today? I just wanna say thank you very much for everyone's time and attention and stay safe. Okay, well, uh, well, thank you. No, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Um, sorry that we didn't get to everyone's question, but all of today's unanswered questions will be forwarded on to our speaker. Once again, uh, just hope you take the time to fill out that evaluation survey to provide your feedback. And again, that'll be on its way. Um, with that, we end today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Pat Sheckle, everyone at Single Wire Software, and all of you who listened in. Thanks and have a great day.